Hi everyone, Dan Higgins here from Astroworld, and today I'm thinking about refractor telescopes. We all know that there are three basic types of telescopes out there, and there are some extra outlying uh, model types of telescopes, uh, but today I'm thinking about a refractor. So I'm wondering a little bit about the history, I'm wondering a little bit about what it can do and what it could see. So let's dive right into it and see what a refracting telescope actually can do. First of all, thank everybody for tuning in, and if you're happy with what you see on Astroworld, please subscribe and hit the bell so you can get all the notifications when Astroworld posts new data. And don't forget to visit astroworldweb.com, our new website, in order to check out all the players at Astroworld and see what we're up to. That being said, let's start taking a look at refracting telescopes. The refracting telescope is the oldest type of telescope out there, and even though Galileo made the telescope extremely popular by being the first recorded person to point the telescope skyward, it was originally used militarily and thought to be invented by Hans Lippershey in Denmark in 1608. It was a small telescope and had a magnifying power of three times the power of your eye. Galileo, after hearing about this invention from a colleague, was inspired to build his own telescope without seeing Lippershey's invention, believe it or not. He went on to be, make great improvements, and eventually he built a telescope that would get approximately 20 times the power of your eye and enable him to discover the rings of Saturn, sunspots, four of Jupiter's moons, as well as a glimpse of diffuse light arching across the sky, which would later be known as the Milky Way Galaxy. Galileo would quickly become convinced that Copernicus's heliocentric model was absolutely correct, a position that would ultimately see him put under house arrest by the Catholic Inquisition until his death in 1642. He was actually in jail for nine years because of this theory. Now that's just some of the history of the refracting telescope. Now let's see what it can actually do for us. A refractor is built with glass lenses and a tube and an eyepiece. It can be built with numerous elements based on the design, but the basic concept of it is this. The lens is a convex lens, which is a lens that is actually curved on both sides, so it can focus an image at the focal point, which is actually somewhere in the tube. The eyepiece then takes over and then magnifies the actual image in order to make an image that you can view. You can have a doublet, a triplet, a quadruplet or a quintuplet refractor, and this name signifies the amounts of elements in the refractor. All of them have an individual purpose, which will be discussed in my next video. So, when it comes with astrophotography, what are the pros and cons of a refractor? So let's start with the pros. First of all, no collimation needed, usually. Usually, refractors need little to no adjustment of the optics. However, if you find that your refractor is out of collimation, most distributors will fix it if necessary. But still, be safe and see your warranty information for each distributor. However, I have owned multiple refractors and none have had a collimation issue to this point. The second pro I want to talk about is a wider field. The refractor can give you a wider field and that can make it a lot more forgiving as far as guiding is concerned. Uh, so it becomes um, a lot easier to guide because you're at that wider field. Um, it, it will also uh, allow you to fit larger deep sky objects on your chip uh, because of the smaller focal length. Uh, so an 80 millimeter at a uh, telescope at 400 millimeter focal length we'll be able to fit natively the Andromeda galaxy on the chip, depending on your chip size. However, the same in a Schmidt-Cassegrain grain without a reducer, uh, we'll probably just get the core of the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, that's not to say that you can't fit the Andromeda galaxy with a Schmidt-Cassegrain grain, you can, uh, but you'll have to get a reducer and you'll have to do some post-processing in order to not see vignetting and that kind of stuff. The last pro that I'd like to talk about is image quality. And it may just be a personal preference for myself, but the image quality through a refractor um, can be outstanding. Um, depending on your seeing, your transparency, uh, all that kind of stuff gets uh, compiled uh, with, your, uh, with your images. But stars, star colors, um, I find personally, and again, it's a Coke and Pepsi thing, but I think that the image quality 
in a refractor exceeds uh, that of even Schmidt cast grains and uh, Newtonium reflectors. So image quality is bar none in a refractor as far as I'm concerned. And like I said, that is a personal preference. Uh, I'm sure that other people uh, out there that do image with different scopes that aren't refractors can get similar results, but I've found that I could get the results a lot easier uh, with a refractor. And now the cons. The first thing that I can think about is that they're more expensive. Because refractors are made of glass lenses, they tend to be more expensive per inch than their reflector counterparts. So for example, you could buy an 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain or SCT for approximately $1,200, uh, where an 8-inch refractor will probably cost you about $20,000, plus you'll need a flatbed because the telescope is going to be about 7 feet long and weigh about 80 pounds. So the second con I can think about with refractors is that it suffers from something called curvature. Now because the refractor is made with convex lenses, things at the center could be at focus while the stars at the edges can be out of focus. Certain telescopes, like the Skywatcher Spree, comes with what is called a flattener. This will compensate for the curve of the lens and make your stars in focus even at the edges. So the last thing on the con list is also on the pro list, the wide field. The wide field is great, but it's not suited for planetary or smaller galaxies and nebula. You'll need a longer focal length in order to get planetary or small nebula, like the Ring Nebula. The refracting telescope is the oldest model of the telescope and has gone through a lot of upgrades in the past 400 years. However, it all comes down to what you want to image. Do you need a wide field of view with low magnification to get the Andromeda Galaxy in one shot? Or do you need a long focal length in order to get into planetary astrophotography? Now this is not to say that you can't get a long focal length shorter, you can. However, you need to add a focal reducer, which we will talk about in an upcoming video. In my humble opinion, the refractor is my go-to type of scope for astrophotography. I love my Esprit 80. I get wide field without the use of other items in the optical train, and it's very forgiving in terms of guiding. So many people come up to me and say, what should I get if I'm starting to get into astrophotography? It depends on many things. What do you want to image? What equipment do you already have? And what's the budget? The refractor is one of the best ways to start in astrophotography, but it's also usually the more expensive one. However, I feel like I'm getting more pleasing images out of my refractor than any other telescope that I've used. Now, I'm not trying to say that you can't get outstanding pics with a Schmidt Cassegrain or a Newtonian. I just prefer the refractor. It's really in the artist's choice. This video was created to give a basic understanding of refracting telescopes and how they can be used for astrophotography. And I hope this helped everybody in some way or other. So if this helped you at all, or it was too basic, let us know in the comments. And as always, keep imaging, keep educating, and keep having fun. Thank you for watching.